this is a collection of images that I've uh, put together of kind of the different around the world, um, these substances, not just cannabis, but uh, many sub substances utilized in, in different religions. Uh, so um, here on the uh, top left are some of the churches in the United States that use ayahuasca. Um, uh, and this is a pouring of ayahuasca tea in South America. This is a uh, from the um, Mexico, a woman uh, with mushrooms in, in, a, in a ritual. Uh, this is a, a, a Christian uh, drinking wine and wafer as part of the communion. Um, this is a Banglasi. Uh, this is Iboga in West Africa. Um, these two, uh, you know, a Kali worshiper. This is a Sufi peer at a shrine in Pakistan, both smoking cannabis from Chilam. Uh, this is a ancient Israelite temple uh, in a place called Tel Arad, where they discovered the residue of cannabis on the temple, a holy altar. Uh, re this was a recent discovery, and it showed that cannabis was part of the rituals of the ancient Israelites like long, long time ago. This is the uh, uh, president of Bolivia, uh, Evo Morales, holding the coca leaves, uh, as describing earlier. This is a kava ceremony in uh, South Pacific, I thought, since you were mentioning kava, it made me think of this. You know, and this, this is also a sacred ritual of um, people, um, you know, coming together and sharing information and things like that. Um, these are actually uh, in the American South. People uh, handle snakes and they drink venom from the snake, uh, strychnine, and they, they they let them, you know, as part of their, uh, they want to like experience that poison and then get close to dying and then they, they survive and become stronger. People have actually died in these rituals, but uh, it, it goes on. These are, uh, all of these are examples of legitimate religious practices where people are bringing in these substances. And then this is a salvia divinorum leaves. And over here is a peyote ceremony in a, like in, in an American uh, context. Uh, thanks. Thank you for uh, having, inviting me Sangam talks, uh, um, Aparna and, um, making me feel uh, welcome here. Um, I'm all the way in Seattle, Washington, um, but uh, I am an overseas citizen of India, OCI. And so it is a great honor for me to present uh, to uh, my, my uh, uh, country, fellow countrymen and in, in, in women in India. And, uh, and so, yeah, thank you. So I would, I'll, what I want to, this is kind of a, a wide ranging talk. I have to say, it's not exactly something that, uh, you know, it's like very, very focused. I'm kind of wanting to be broad. And, and the reason I, I, I wanted to talk like this is because um, I think in order to fully understand cannabis and uh, sort of the, the challenging issues that we face socially, politically uh, in the world today related to its uh, regulation and its trade and its consumption and its uses and all the different things, the cultural aspects, uh, you really we need to really attend to the um, the unique aspect of cannabis, which uh, uh, which very few there's a there's a subset of plants and, and naturally occurring things in the world that are in this category. And that's this is a term I'm using entheogens. Entheogens is a term that was that means substances that have been used historically to generate awe um, and uh, usually in religious or spiritual practices and. And that's a, that's a, cannabis is uniquely in that category. There's a few other things too. And um, we, in our modern context, sometimes might forget about those aspects and think, okay, well, you know, um, I want to just sort of analyze it rationally and think about it as a, uh, a medicine for, uh, you know, a particular ailment. But um, a, the, the much wider understanding of cannabis is actually something that I think is the reason why it was so, uh, its praises were sung so much in the, um, uh, you know, thousands of years ago. And that's some of the things I'll talk a little bit about. See, the Indian story is quite unique with cannabis because, you know, India has the unique, uh, I think, 
you know, uh, distinction of being probably the first, um, you know, area in the world that actually got exposed to, to cannabis, um, the first in the world. So uh, I very likely, you know, Indian uh, and people who were living in this uh, part of the South Asian subcontinent were probably the first humans to ever get experienced to this particular urban. And I think that's, a, that's kind of a, it gives us a special um, responsibility to make sure that it's stewarded uh, well in the world and that we actually, um, in India, like appreciate its, um, and then, you know, the whole South Asian region appreciate its role in our, um, uh, in the development of, of, of thought and medicine and healing and, and spiritual practice. I think that's, that's kind of uh, what I'm trying to say. And, you know, another interesting thing about that is that uh, people wonder, like, how did cannabis become so um, powerful? Like, what uh, gave it the, uh, uh, the those powers? Uh, you know, one of the theories is, is that cannabis evolved in about, it's kind of about 38 million years old, if you look at the evolutionary history of the plant. And um, around the time that it was... Um, you know, ancestral cannabis was on the uh, probably the India, China, Tibetan plateau region, that area. Um, uh, it actually, that was the time that the Himalayas were actually starting to get taller and taller. Uh, about 80, uh, several tens of millions of years before that, the Indian subcontinent had started to collide into the Asian landmass, Laurasia was called. And so every year, the altitude and elevation got higher and higher and higher. And so you can imagine a plant that's evolving in a zone that's getting higher and higher in elevation. The highest elevation on the entire on the entire planet is, is the Himalayas. So the exposure to UV radiation uh, was uh, probably one of the greatest of any any plants around. And I uh, I think that that's one of the theories as to why the cannabis plant produced so many natural what we call secondary metabolites in its resin in the resin that the le uh, the flowers secrete especially the female plant cannabis is a dioecious that means it has two sexes and sometimes hermaphrodites too um, wind pollinated plant and the resin is produced by the female flowers and that resin is sticky so that it can capture the pollen um, and and that resin also has protective properties, you know, to protect the plant from insects and from radiation and um, other other harms in the environment. And so that's that's probably one of the reasons. So uh, that it is as strong as it is. So that's kind of an interesting, um, I think, a geographic uh, lesson. So what I want to talk first about is, um, you know. I, I want to get really broad. And so the first thing I wanted to go into is talk to uh, tell you about a very, um, a very famous scientist. Um, so I want to show you the picture of a, a, a man here named Carl Sagan. Uh, this, this is him here. Um, I don't know, many of you might know him, at least in the US, he's very, very uh, famous uh, because he, uh, he popularized astronomy and he had a series called The Cosmos. Um, and, you know, everyone remembers him saying, talking about how there are billions and billions of stars. Uh, he also is uh, the scientist who um, uh, put together the uh, golden record that is on the Voyager spacecraft. The Vo Voyager spacecraft is the farthest object that humans have ever sent into the uh, galaxy. I mean, it's it's a, it's a consistent. It's a spacecraft that's still traveling and still sending back signals to Earth, and it's like billions and billions of miles away now. Uh, quite quite remarkable. And so he put together in multiple languages, um, like a representation that if anyone ever were to find it, like this is this record of of our of our people. So that's quite a remarkable um, position to to be the ambassador for the entire, uh, you know, uh, a human race <laughs> in some way. So anyway, uh, and by the way, there's some really interesting news currently that Voyager's signal just recently, they started getting some different information from it. So anyway, maybe, maybe somebody's found it and they'll see Carl Sagan's, um, you know, uh, uh, record. Anyway, so when he, when he was in his thirties, he wrote an essay about his experiences with cannabis. 
uh, uh, which he did not want published under his name because of the, uh, the stigma, the social issues that were associated with cannabis um, you know, in those days. Uh, and he only asked his friend uh, who published it to uh, show who his name is after he dies. And so when Carl Sagan passed away, you know, um, the, his friend, his name was Lester Grinspoon. He was a friend of mine. He's also now passed away about a year ago. He was a Harvard psychiatrist um, and, and um, pretty brilliant. And so he had introduced Carl Sagan to, to cannabis marijuana. And um, so here's what here's what one of the things that Carl Sagan said, which I thought was very interesting uh, uh, regarding cannabis. And, you know, because this the, he if he focused on many aspects, like, you know, its ability to um, improve the sensations around art or music. But he also talked about the religious aspects, the spiritual aspects. And I think, you know, a scientist of his stature who really had a deep understanding of cosmology, astronomy, uh, you know, uh, you know what, what is he saying about this? And we should pay attention because he was uh, so renowned. He was a professor at Cornell, I believe. So he said, I do not consider myself a religious person in the usual sense but there was a religious aspect to some highs. The heightened sensitivity in all areas gives me a feeling of communion with my surroundings, both animate and inanimate. Sometimes a kind of existential perception of the absurd comes over me and I see with awful certainty the hypocrisies and posturing of myself and my fellow men. And at other times, there is a different sense of the absurd, a playful and whimsical awareness. Both of these senses of the absurd can be communicated, and some of the most rewarding highs I've ever ha uh, I had ever uh, been in sharing uh, I've had have been in sharing talk and perceptions and humor. Cannabis brings us an awareness that we spend a lifetime being trained to overlook and forget and put out of our minds. So, like a, a sense, of, you know, like a return to an awareness, maybe like a childlike wonder. Uh, some kind of, uh, you know, that's that awe uh, that children, you know, often have when, when facing everything and curiosity. So a sense of what the world is really like can be maddening. Cannabis has brought me some of the feelings for what it is like to be crazy. And how we use that word crazy to avoid thinking about things that are too painful for us. It gives an example of the Soviet Union in those days that the pol political dissidents were placed in ins insane asylums. Um, the same kind of thing occurs here and in, uh, you know, in the U.S. And he gives an example of uh, a comedian that, uh, you know, maybe people said he must be crazy. But, um, you know, he says, when high on cannabis, I discovered that there's somebody inside those people we call mad. So what he's talking about is that he gets a greater sense of uh, empathy or a greater sense of what it must be like to be this person that we consider to be mad or, or what it's like, like to have different thoughts or different views. And I think this is a very powerful uh, tool that we humans who, you know, uh, really need our social arrangements and need to understand each other and need to live together. We need to be able to see the world through each other's uh, perspectives. And I think that's what he's talking about. And, um, you know, he talks, he talked a little bit about also, you know, how he was able to also not only get ideas about other people, but also into himself, deeply into his own sense, his inner memories and, um, you know, things that come uh, that, that are much earlier in his past. And, uh, and so, you know, then he says that, and this is a really important point, you know, uh, People say there's a myth about such highs, that the user uh, has an illusion of a great insight, but I am not uh, does not survive scrutiny in the morning. But he gives an example of how he came up with many ideas when he was uh, taking cannabis, and he wrote them down, and he said he wrote many, many essays and gave lectures at university commencements and all kinds of like, academic talks and things where these insights were actually found to be useful. So I think it's, um, it's kind of a myth that these kind of insights are really like, oh, the next day they, don't, they didn't mean anything. They sounded, they felt profound, but actually had no meaning. And so that's what he's talking about here. Uh, I just think, I think this is something worth remarking on. So now with that background, I want to share with you, like, so, you know, Carl Sagan isn't the first person to discover this idea. 
this is something that um, I think, you know, again, given that the uh, Indian subcontinent is the place where cannabis was first uh, probably, uh, you know, explored for, for a very long time, um, you know, does it surprise you that something of this magnitude would be uh, uh, discussed? You know, of all the millions of species of plants and other things, you know, this plant was particularly called out. So uh, there is a book called Sacred Bliss, A Spiritual History of Cannabis, which was published in 2016, written by Mark Ferrara. He's a professor of English. Um, and uh, so this is a review of that book I'll read from you uh, that was written by Lisa Barnett, Texas Christian University. Um, recognizing that social attitudes are changing about the legalization of marijuana, Ferrara's work seeks to explore the historical role of cannabis in producing and sustaining spiritual awakenings with both sacred and secular benefits. He devotes his first five chapters to an examination of cannabis as it informed the history of religions in the world. So this is a big, I think cannabis's ability for us to deeply understand multiple religious traditions is a very important in, uh, in our current context where there's so much conflict. So, Chapter one, what's the beginning? The focus on India and Vedic Soma uh, rituals uh, and rites uh, with a cannabis-inspired adoration of Shiva associated with sadhu and Hindu mendicants. Cannabis ingestion became one spiritual response to the non-dualism interpreted from the Upanishads and Bhagavad Gita as devotees use cannabis as a useful tool in exploring consciousness associated with religious experience. Chapter two moves the discussion from South Asia to Persia uh, and Anatolia and the Middle East, where on the Iranian plateau, Zoroastrian priests smoked the herb to produce religious ecstasy. Before the arrival of Islam in the seventh century, the Avesta scripture, that's the book of the Zoroastrians called Zend Avesta, uh, which referred, referenced hashish as a beneficial narcotic. And their term, by the way, was haoma. So soma, haoma, very similar. Um, and Mithraic sacrifices contributed to the use of cannabis in religious experience. When Islam emerged as the dominant religion, the use of cannabis as a religious adjunct persisted among the Persian Sufi sects of Islam in spite of the Quran's prohibition on intoxicants that cloud the mind. Sufi mystics did not consider this injunction applicable to cannabis, as they believed it revealed truth rather than obscured it. And then he goes on to talk about what happened in China, in China uh, with the cultivation of cannabis as a foodstuff, a natural fiber, a healing agent became more prominent than its religious and relig ritualistic uses. Uh, and uh, he talks about the uh, Taoist texts in, in, in China and the important pharmacological understanding of cannabis as a treatment of various ail variety of ailments. And many of those uh, herbal knowledges, people believe, also were uh, informed by Ayurvedic uh, understandings that, that had been developed as well in the Indian subcontinent. So this is really kind of, a, you know, cannabis traveled in these different areas in the world and the people that came into touch with it learned and discovered new things. So, um, you know, the Taoists talked about cannabis as a healing herb uh, and helped us with their understanding of the integral connections between body and the cosmos and the relationship between mental and physical wellness. Um, on the Tibetan plateau, there was a unique form of Buddhism known as Vajrayana or Tantra that wove together. So Tantra means weaving together of Indian Vedanta, Shaivite Hinduism, and a range of Bon deities that were indigenous to that region of, of uh, Tibet. Uh, and there was esoteric knowledge of medicinal plants and herbs, and they incorporated cannabis in the religious system. And then later on, it moves around the globe to the African continent, uh, beyond uh, to African religious influences in other parts of the world through imperial colonization, that is to say, uh, when African um, were enslaved and brought to the new to the Caribbean or the South America, uh, they also brought with them uh, cannabis. Um, and you know there was there's 
there are writings that talk about how they sowed the seeds of cannabis into little dolls that they had on their uh, on their ragged clothing. Uh, it was that important. Uh, the same stories are told about the um, indenture, the the uh, what do they call them? Um, Giramatayas. These are people that uh, in the 19th century were taken, usually lower caste, from like uh, Madras and other places, and were shipped on the same ships that were used for transatlantic slave trade to work in sugarcane fields in uh, Caribbean and in um, Mauritius and places like that. They also brought cannabis with them. So th this uh, this is an important thing. I mean, if you have if you're going to travel to a strange land and you have so few things that you can take with you, uh, what are the few things that you bring? So I think this is like it's such an important. Uh, it's so uh, this history and the fact that it traveled around the world like this is what I'm kind of trying to share with you a little bit about. Um, so uh, the last uh, area that I want to mention is uh, actually uh, a religion called Rastafarianism, which was evolved in Jamaica uh, and in Africa. And they also ha have revered cannabis as well, taken that same kind of reverence that you read in, in the old uh, uh, Vedic texts and also believe that it's this healing herb. Uh, and they believe that it's like uh, can help heal the nations. And I, I, this is kind of what I want to um, think a little bit about. Like, what is the capacity of this substance to help uh, in healing social uh, challenges? Uh, how is that possible? And is, is that something we should take seriously? So what I wanted to talk to you about is that um, social healing dimension and how is it possible? So one of the things that we have discovered as try in the process of understanding how does this cannabis plant do the things that creates all these spiritual religious experiences and awareness, what is going on chemically inside the nervous system that we've evolved here? Um, and so in 1988, uh, after you know all these thousands of years of usage, uh, human beings finally found out that uh, there is a receptor in the brain called the endocannabinoid type 1 receptor or CB1 receptor. Uh, and for the longest time, nobody knew. There was one chemical they had identified, THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, in 1964. But nobody really knew, well, what is this oily, oily uh, 21 carbon chemical doing in the body? We don't really know. It, maybe it's going into the, the cell membranes. Nobody really had an idea until 1988. Um, uh, a, a uh, professor at uh, Washington University in St. Louis, uh, Ellen Hallett, and her postdoc uh, discovered this. And, um, you know, uh, they discovered that this receptor was one of the most widespread receptors throughout the brain. In fact, probably the most populated re re receptor in many, many parts of the brain. Uh, higher centers, lower centers, uh, that they're also found in the gut and immune cells in many places, not just the brain, but all, all throughout the body. And there's other receptors that have been discovered. And then they said, okay, well, if there's receptors, there must be uh, naturally occurring chemicals that are binding to these receptors as well. And that was discovered in 94, the first naturally occurring chemical. And that chemical was, uh, full name is 2-arachidonyl, oh, sorry. It is a uh, oh, 2-acylglycerol, I believe. Uh, uh, they're, they're, they're long names. The, the, the shorthand name is anandamide. Uh, and the uh, professor, William Devane, he coined that term because he had studied a lot of ancient Sanskrit texts and studied Vedic ideas. And he says, this is like, we should name this after the idea of what supreme bliss, what, what is the first name for the highest form of bliss? And that, that word is ananda. Uh, and so, this compound is now known throughout, you know, science as anandamide, the first compound that was discovered. So there must be some value to anand, to bliss in the normal functioning of the human nervous system, in the normal functioning of our health and well-being. And that, I think, is sort of what cannabis is helping, um, you know, to foster, to stimulate. Because we human beings have really good memories, uh, and we human beings adapt to all kinds of situations. Um, and I think in order for us to have been as successful as we are on this planet, um, 
we have to be uh, really good at survival. Survival is a often a state of fear and danger and alarm uh, to, to deal with threats. But um, we also have another state of being, which is about uh, how, uh, a nervous system that is uh, kind of thriving and creative and playful and um, you know constructive. Uh, that is not a fight or flight state. That is a more of a, uh, a state of joy, honestly, and creativity. And that is, I think, one of the keys that cannabis is helping people. Um, and then maybe this is why it's so revered, get into that state um, and out of an alarm fear state. Uh, and I think that's sort of maybe one of the functions that this endocannabinoid system in the body um, is, is, is doing, is getting us, helping us get into that state. But oftentimes when we are um, traumatized um, or injured, um, actually, one of the areas that we know where this system uh, probably uh, can have impacts is when you get socially rejected. Uh, so there's, a, there's actually psychology experiments that show this. So using cannabis may help us to foster what we call pro-social behaviors, because now the system in our body that is naturally geared towards connection uh, is, is, is getting uh, fed. So that I think is kind of the psych, the kind of chemical, psychological, neurolo neurological understanding that uh, gives us a bit better appreciation beyond okay, this cannabis is a food of the gods. Yes, I think you can revere cannabis in many places around the world. It is revered, and I think the more that we have this, what I call deep respect around cannabis, we will begin to fully um, uh, cultivate its its greatest benefits. Um, and I think on, on top of that, you can also have this very, um, you know, scientific, you can say, or um, materialist understanding of this as a rich resin of chemicals that uh, seem to in, uh, support the body's homeostasis. Um, and I think, and, and cannabis is not the only thing that can do that, by the way. May, this endocannabinoid system is also fed by um, exercise and certain foods that we eat and um, uh, something called osteopathic manipulative treatment uh, and acupuncture and all kinds of things. So it's, it's, it's beyond that, but it's kind of the cannabis has yet again given us an insight into the world, into how we work, how our bodies function. And I think that's very profound. So um, that's kind of what I, I wanted to say. Um, I think uh, what's really interesting uh, from a social uh, per perspective is, is uh, the ability to reduce violence in the world and aggression. And I think that's, that's an unsung aspect that we need to talk more about. Uh, inner peace and social peace, uh, we so much need to be a present to what's going on in the world and our environments in order to tackle the problems that we are facing today, uh, climate change and uh, conflicts. And that's what I'm hoping that uh, more as India sort of awakens up to cannabis again. And, you know, by the way, India is, has claimed in its traditional knowledge, digital library, uh, cannabis is medicinal uh, and healing properties. And it's why, why not? Uh, I think it's something to be very uh, proud of and, and to, to, to explore. It's remarkable. What happened in the 60s is that uh, the Western, um, you know, forces sort of uh, met in the United Nations and said, oh, we, we need to eradicate cannabis. It's, it's part of an old way of thinking. We need new medicines, new drugs, of course, that people are going to make and sell you. And we need, we need to uh, slowly eliminate cannabis. And, and it was India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, all of these countries. And you can, I've read the uh, UN documents in the 60s, uh, late 50s, early 60s, we were having the meetings in New York to make this treaty. They said, hey, we're not going to be able to eliminate cannabis. This is uh, used throughout uh, this, our country for medicinal and quasi-medicinal, they said in this the document purposes. And I think quasi-medicinal meaning ceremonial and, and ritual and all these things. So, you know, they said, we're not going to be able to do this. How in, how in the world could we possibly do this? And then the Western country says, okay, that's fine. We'll give you 50 years. 
And they literally, you know, had to sign a treaty that said in 50 years, they have to eliminate this thing. Like, can you imagine, you know, imagine uh, somebody coming to, you know, the United States or the one of the Western countries say, oh, uh, England, you guys look to drink tea, you know, or you like to eat this. We're going to let you in 50 years. It's okay. Just keep doing it. But in 50 years, you're going to have to get rid of it. And, you know, I, I have to say that this, uh, this is a kind of an intolerable situation that India and uh, South Asian countries sort of fell into. Um, and, a real, and then finally the clock, uh, I, I, I think, actually it wasn't 50, it was 25 years. So um, it, it, it finally, that, that clock ended in the mid eighties. And um, that is when in, uh, India instituted more strict regulations related to cannabis in its N, NP, NDPS act. Um, or, or it was during the tenure of Rajiv Gandhi. Um, and uh, this is why people lost all the, in many places where cannabis was more widely available, uh, it became very restricted. Um, cannabis was still retained for its religious purposes, uses in the UN treaties, but it was like only the leaves of cannabis is what they said. But um, that's sort of a, I, we can talk more about that in the question and answer. I just wanted to share that perspective with the Indian audience uh, so you can kind of understand how this Cannabis was the main focus of that entire United Nations meeting. There was opium in there and, and coca, other things, but the most discussion and most confusion uh, was regarding cannabis. And now you can see why. It's very valuable. Um, and uh, what was the other thing? Uh, uh, religious use uh, was allowed. And, uh, and actually now in the uh, recent times, uh, one country in South America, Bolivia, actually removed themselves from the treaty and then rejoined. And this gave them a, to reset the 25 year clock. That's, this, is, this is what this country, because they, they said coca leaves, which is another plant in there, which is also sacred to South, uh, in the Andes. This is our, this is a spiritual plant for them. And they didn't, they couldn't tolerate all this like prohibition. So uh, the president was uh, sworn in on a, a bed of coca leaves on the flag of, uh, in uh, Bolivia, and they just removed themselves from the treaty, and then they rejoined. So this is like, these are some of the options that are available to India uh, and that can be done. And I think it's, uh, it's something that uh, it's, it's sort of high time for this to happen. My question was that um, wouldn't using this as a psychological aid of sorts lead to the same problems of addiction as people have with other products like alcohol, oxycodone, etc., because they'll become dependent on something external to help with their problems. And unless they rely on their inner resources to manage themselves, I feel like this, these solutions might be potentially risky, but I'm keen to hear your thoughts on that. Absolutely, Aditi. Thank you for the question. It's a very good question. Um, the the science and understanding of addiction um, has come a long way in the last few decades. Um, there is a, a, a new understanding. Uh, there's a professor named Bruce Alexander. He wrote a book called Globalization of Addiction. Uh, he's in uh, British Columbia, uh, Vancouver. Um, and uh, his book and many others, uh, he, he, has, he looked at all the research and understanding and he says, addiction is actually a social bonding disorder um, and that uh, it, it is tied intimately to the conditions in which uh, substances or any behaviors that uh, pro pro uh, provide reward, which includes even sitting here on the internet, like as we were discussing here, how much, uh, and playing video games and, uh, and sex and gambling and shopping and money and so many things that provide produce reward. What are the conditions in which that creates um, this situation of addiction, which is a maladaptive? So uh, these ideas have un have have developed and helped us understand that addiction is actually a coping mechanism, uh, and that is tied to a form of inner distress, uh, and that distress it appears has to ha has the origins in social. Uh, lack of social reserve or social capacity to um, connect with with others, and I think potentially deeply with with yourself 
Because the first person, the first person socially that you meet is your own self, you know. And so there's an interesting way to think about the the role of, of relationship with yourself and then relationship with others. And so that that is kind of, I think, what and so some of the research that's established this is like actually animal studies. Um, they had developed a, an experiment called Rat Park. Um, and, and when the animals, if they have all kinds of other things to do in their rat, in their rat uh, community, like there's little games they can play, wheels they can run on, there's other rats there, uh, even though there's a button where they can take uh, oxycodone-like chemical, like a morphine chemical or cocaine chemical, even though there's a button, they can go there and press that anytime and, and receive that reward. They do not get into a repetitive self-administrative pattern if there are these other aspects in the environment. And this was, this was shown over and over again. Uh, so this shows us that uh, we are, that addiction is really a product of the context, the social environment. The way that you limit and reduce its uh, situation is to improve um, education, to, imp uh, to reduce the stigma um, that's associated with, with uh, any kind of behavior uh, to, uh, to make it so that it's, it's more in the open and that um, it doesn't have to be hidden away. These are the things that foster addiction. Um, it turns out that cannabis and these, these kinds of substances actually can help reduce addictive behaviors. Uh, there was one study in, um, in London that was done by uh, uh, Val Coran and, and, uh, and, and colleagues where they actually gave people uh, CBD, which is another aspect of cannabis in a, a vaporizing uh, cartridge. And the, those who would use that actually were able to quit tobacco smoking. Uh, at a higher rate compared to those who did not. There was a, there was a study on this. And, and actually other, another substance that's also an entheogen that I'm interested in is called psilocybin, which is in mushrooms. And there was a study at Johns Hopkins University that if patients were to take psilocybin uh, and have a guide uh, and, and help prepare them for that experience, their ability to quit smoking tobacco smoking, as, as long as they were demotivated to do that, actually was, was uh, they had a higher success rate. So that is a kind of a, I think this, is, this has a potential and many people in the field of addiction are really excited about these entheogenic substances to help heal addiction. Also alcoholism, there's a friend of mine did a study, uh, was involved in a study in New Mexico where they used psilocybin to help with alcohol uh, use behaviors. So that's what I think is will help us get out of that cycle. Repression breeds obsession. I think that's sort of a, a mantra that I think we can um, learn from. Uh, there will always people, people will have problems with substances. I'm not going to say that that's not going to be the case, but they will be far less more likely to get help for those problems. Uh, if we have created a accepting environment where it does not have to be pushed underground. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, you said it helps them uh, give up alcoholism and other things. Its utility lies there. Do you think that happens uh, in them replacing one addiction with another or is there more to it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, partly it is it's substitution, which is also called harm reduction. Um, would you rather live with addiction or die with addiction? That's one question we should ask ourselves. Because if you stay addicted to alcohol, your chances of dying are much, much higher. Actually, the, the rate of um, you know, cardiac uh, conditions, liver disorders, gut problems, cancers, all of these things are, are known to be increased with chronic alcohol consumption. So your likelihood of dying is much more. If you then switch something to cannabis, uh, you know, well, you're, you, you could still have a problematic behavior relationship, but you're not at risk of dying. There's more chance uh, for you to get help. Uh, and I, you know, I think the, when I say substitution and all these things, it's not like it's just a drug solution. With, with a condition like addiction, which as I described as a social bonding disorder, um, and there's some great talks on this if you, if you look up a, 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 a author, Johan Hari, H-A-R-I, he wrote a book called Chasing the Scream. Uh, and he has a TED talk, which has hundreds of millions of views, I think, at this point um, on, on this. And he describes it. So please take a look at that. But um, so uh, with that kind of condition, you cannot heal from that in isolation. You need community. 
you need group, you need support. Uh, and so that uh, will reduce the likelihood of falling into another addiction. So we, we, I, I'm believing in what I'm calling is a kind of a cannabis assisted therapy. Um, and I think these kind of, um, this is sort of where I think uh, addiction can. Uh, so, I, you know, I think I would turn the question back to you. Um, have you ever seen people um, who have non-addictive relationships with um, with substances like alcohol and cannabis? And if they do, why do they have non-addictive relationships? What are the what are the conditions that foster that versus the conditions that foster maladaptive relationships? Uh, so my other question was just like alcohol and other drugs can calm you a bit, but at a certain point they can also agitate you. Is that a risk right. with cannabis intake at all? Absolutely, yeah. You know the 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 term um, farm. Uh, pharmaceutical comes from the word pharmakon, which is the ancient Greek word. And the pharmakon meant two things. It meant both a drug, a healing agent, and a poison. So in everything that you can take, there is both a drug aspect and a poisonous aspect. Um, and I think that um, that is also true with cannabis. Uh, anything that isn't taken in excess, um, you know, can lead to to dysfunction and problem, um, you know, uh, and, and I think this this is again a part of why I wanted to spend so much time discussing the spiritual and religious aspects that these create a what we call a container, a context where you know people are okay. You've achieved a certain kind of bliss understanding. You've you've made it. You don't need to take any more. You've gotten there. This is what we're looking for. Whereas if you don't have a container, you don't have a context. You don't have an understanding you might end up taking more and more and more, you know, and like, oh, what am I, what, I don't know what I'm looking for. So I think um, that, and if you do take too much, yeah, or, or a lot, lots, especially with high dose THC, you can, you can, can feel like, um, you know, agitated, uh, anxious, uh, sometimes people fall asleep, uh, sedated. Um, and, you know, it's uh, certainly, uh, some people have more or less risk tolerance to that. So, that's a, that's a, that's absolutely a given. And I think that's part of why these texts are there to help us understand how to use these things more as medicines and less as poisons. Uh, and, you know, interestingly enough, even the government agencies, uh, the intelligence agencies have used these substances as toxins, as poisons to, uh, you know, in, in covert warfare. There's even there's a, a, a guy who wrote a book about that in a, a place called Edgewood Arsenal in the United States. They used a synthetic form of THC and gave it to uh, military recruits to study how can we make people go crazy with this, you know, because we like, that's a useful tool when they're fighting, you know, covert wars uh, and many other such substances. So there's actual research on that, <laughs> like, you know, uh, that was government funded. So unfortunately, there's always this dark side. And that's why it's so important for human beings to develop a good relationships um, and positive. And, and it's up to us to, to do that. Because without any kind of container, it can certainly go any other way. Uh, so Neil, and um, is this, uh, are you taking uh, cannabis out of context? In the sense, this, when you mentioned the Upanishads, this was taken by people who were highly spiritually evolved probably thousands of years ago. And now in modern world where people are anyway fried in the mind, you are bringing only one aspect of whatever you call Soma or cannabis. And uh, is it just being another tool where the world is looking for the next fix? Or is it no. something a little bit more like what is seen at the Burning Man, the Burning Man Festival? And there's a book which is called uh, Stealing Fire by Stephen Kotler which yeah. has just mentioned how psychedelics are now being used by uh, big multinational companies to accelerate performance of their top CEOs. Right. <laughs> so right. again, is it a case of US, US trying to do a business out of spirituality or something? Just, just you know, I just wanted to ask you that. Uh, very good. Uh, very good, Rajiji. I really appreciate this question. It's, it's, it's very thoughtful. You know, this is, this is why I titled my talk, Deep Respect after profound neglect. Uh, and I think it's really important for us to be able to, 
to reanimate a sense of the sacred, the sense of a reverence to something that has this kind of power and potency. The uh, international um, capitalist uh, framework is all about commodification. The thing is valuable to you because it fetches a high price uh, and it allows you to trade your stocks and buy your third home. That's, that is not the value that cannabis is being lauded for. It's not for its ability to, to grow your, um, your bank account. Uh, although certainly, you know, any commodity in demand has that capacity. Um, it was not, and that's why it's so, it was, uh, they created this context. Uh, and, and certainly people still have to supply those priests. Somebody has to supply that uh, the system that is created to, uh, you know, in this way. But it, there, there were limits placed on it, I think. And I think that's that's where we need to be a little bit more, um, you know, uh, approach it with a, uh, a sense of, uh, well, we need to kind of be a little bit more social with this, more uh, create more context and containers where it's just not like you're going to buy something at the vending machine. Like you're buying tobacco cigarettes in a vent. We had when I was a kid, you could buy uh, cigarettes in a vending machine. You just put some quarters in, and and you you got your your box of cigarettes. There was no nobody. You know, tobacco was a very ceremonial plant for the uh, Native Americans. Uh, you know, it was one of the most uh, sacred plants actually. But it turned into from that to you know uh, to something that was very commodified. So I think there's a, there is a definitely a risk in that, but. The interesting thing about cannabis and these substances is that they also resist that um, because because of their ability to generate kind of a uh, oh I'm gonna you know, to break the con the break the framework you know like um, you might buy something like this and then you say oh I had an insight and I I'm not just a a consuming machine uh, uh, that I have other values and worth and. So I think that there's a natural, uh, it's very hard to do. I mean, uh, of course, corporations and things will find these ways. And I think this is sort of one of the issues that India is also facing. You know, uh, companies came to India to, to do clinical trials with cannabis when on a substance that they themselves, you know, originated from their own, um, um, you know, country. Uh, and so it's important for, for, uh, people to take ownership over their cannabis and sort of this, this is part of our, our environment. They have, have a pride in it uh, and you'll be less likely to be succumbed to marketing campaigns or, um, you know, things like that. So I, I think you're, you're right. I mean, I'm trying, I think that that religion and spirituality, I think the world, I, I think there's a way in which we can all kind of have different paths, but also still have a common sense of awe uh, of, of things that are sacred. Um, and I think uh, everybody everybody can recognize that there's something special to these substances, and that's why scholars coined this term in 1979, entheogen, entheogen, generating uh, the God within, the theo, the divine, whatever you want to call that. If there is something like that in the world, um, these substances are intimately tied with that. And of course, you can make money out of God. Uh, I mean, that's sort of a, that's the that's the the Catholic Church which is the oldest religious institution continuous in the world, has extreme wealth. Um, and, uh, but I think there's more to it. And, and I think that's sort of why I, I think these substances may have us a, a, give us a path to rediscovering some of these aspects. And the other thing I want to say, one more thing, the access to spiritually inducing entheogens has always been very much a class-based story. Uh, priestly class, upper class, all of these folks, or the you know they kept things in secret and they didn't want to share, and you know secret societies in Europe. And uh, I think it's a a time now for us to break use these substances to help break down some of these divisions. In India, which is inter ironically a very class society, cannabis is available in these bong shops, but very few people in the cities go to them or know about them because it's associated with lower class. It's associated with this, and with, you know, male spaces and rather than female spaces, there's all kinds of divisions that are there. And I think, but as I said, the big virtue is this the ability to be so pro-social. So how can we put it in a container where you're not dividing people, dividing up only you can go, not you, not you, you're the wrong, 
race. You're the wrong religion. You're the wrong caste. You're the wrong class. And say, no, you know, this is a, this is a substance that actually uh, everybody can enjoy um, and, um, and actually help build social, social uh, harmony. So I kind of have that Pollyanna dream. I, I, that's what I'm believing. And, and I, I, uh, I, I have seen these kind of contexts, I have to say, that the, like in, in other parts of the world. I visited Amsterdam. I visited uh, places in Canada, and, uh, the U- in Canada where cannabis was, is now legal. And I've seen, uh, I've seen these kind of potentials. And, and that's what I think is, uh, is possible for us. But it's not going to be just the drug, the substance. It's going to be also in a container of understanding. Uh, and I think the Upanishads are one of the oldest containers that are around, you know, that have been actually written down. There's, there's many others as well since that. But uh, this is one of the oldest written texts in Indo-European uh, languages on this, that has this topic. There's many other topics in there too. But those other topics are not criminally uh, criminalized around the world. You know, uh, cannabis is criminalized around the world. Uh, so it's and, and, and many people uh, face long, harsh sentences. It's, it's uh, disproportionately enforced laws. So it's very important that we learn from these old texts uh, so that we can get on a better path today. Um, before I go on to Aditi, I would like to ask, uh, because see, cannabis is a plant based thing. And uh, I had a, I have heard people asking questions in spiritual gatherings about something called Ayahuasca, which is again from South America. I would like you to tell us more about this. And second question, you said that certain foods can induce the same effect. That I would like yeah. to know. Okay, certainly. Uh, um, the, the first question regarding Ayahuasca, uh, which means vine of the soul, um, is a, um, a mixture, a tea that's made in, like you said, South America. Uh, we don't know exactly when. Thousands of years ago, uh, shamans in the forest discovered that you could mix two plants together. It's not just one plant. You have to actually find two different types of plants. One is a vine called Banisteropsis copy, and one is uh, a herb uh, called uh, Sacotria viridas. Their common names are Yage and Chacruna. And you mix Yage and Chacruna, the leaves of, of uh, Chacruna and the vine of Yage, uh, and you put them in hot water, and you boil that, and you make a tea. And this tea, or when you drink it, uh, it contains from the vine a MAOI inhibitor, monoamine oxidase, um, uh, called uh, <laughs> harmaline. Harmaline. And by the way, this word harmaline comes from the plant pe- uh, pe- pegalala harmala, which is one of the ingredients that is thought to be in haoma, in the uh, one of the theories of what is actually, so th- these substances are not just unique to that region of the world. That's, that's kind of what I wanted to tell you. Even though I lost this in that part of the world, there's actually probably combinations like this in other parts of the world as well. But um, this one has become much more uh, wide, known. So anyway, these, um, the harmala, harma alkaloids in the vine uh, inhibit MAOI, an en- uh, MAO, an enzyme in the gut. And this allows the chemical from the flower uh, from the, the 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 leaves, DMT, dimethyltryptamine, to absorb into the uh, blood, and and it and it has a very profound effect on the nervous system and the immune system in the body. Um, people experience true many many different things, um, and they and it goes on for hours. Uh, a sense of great awe, a sense of terror, a sense of people describe. Ex- uh, all kinds of uh, phenomenological experiences, and this is this is very profound. Um, and and you know this kind of powerful substance, they had to build a container, and there are many such containers, including actual religious sects um, that have developed around this substance, like a soma. Uh, uh, one of two of the most famous churches are the Santo Daime Church and the Unio de Vegetal. They're both from Brazil. There's, there's a third one as well. And two of them uh, have been recognized in, the, in my country, United States, by the Supreme Court um, as a religious path that needs to be protected. So uh, it is a, uh, and, and in many other countries of the world as well. Um, so uh, I think it's a, um, I have my, my, my co-director of Ames Institute. She is studying ayahuasca. 
um, in her research uh, and its healing potentials. She's interested in its role in healing patients with cancer uh, and other chronic conditions. We're interested in its ability to help all kinds of healing. Uh, and I, I'm very excited about it. And I think it's, uh, again, uh, there is an international treaty that, that bans DMT, um, which is really terrible. And guess what? DMT is made in our brains, uh, naturally. It's a, a chemical in the, uh, I think, secreted by pineal gland. Um, and pineal gland is actually uh, in the middle of the brain. And this is, you know, people talk about the third eye. Probably uh, the pineal gland is actually, there, there's, uh, there's fish that still have a third eye. And that, that vestigial organ of the pineal gland was probably in, in ancient evolution was a eye because uh, it has light sensing capacities even today. The pineal gland helps us with our daylight uh, diurnal cycles. So anyway, this substance that's secreted by the vestigial third eye is found in these, in these leaves and you can experience, you can take it in and, and have a, you know, a religious experience in a good container. Uh, and I think that's, um, that's kind of what you're hearing about. And, um, you know, but again, it's another, so it's a Soma story. There's many Somas. Uh, so I think, uh, and that's what, what's beautiful about this. This is, an, this is not just cannabis. This is cannabis is part of a larger family of substances. The second question that you had was um, related to, uh, uh, oh, the other, the foods. Yeah. So um, the, the endocannabinoid system, there's a, a chap, an article you can read called Care and Feeding of the Endocannabinoid System. It's uh, by a Dr. McPartland. Uh, and he describes... Uh, the eating of omega rich, omega-3 and omega-6 rich foods. Um, and that these substances are the building blocks that you need to produce the endocannabinoids, the chemical, the naturally occurring chemicals in the body that uh, uh, Im improve the homeostasis. Um, that's sort of, that's one thing that I know. There's, there's more details in that article. I'd encourage you to look, but um, it's, it's about eating those, those kinds of, of fatty acid, uh, healthy fatty acid precursors. Um, and uh, there are uh, rich sources of that in the plant kingdom is actually the seeds of cannabis. Uh, the hemp seeds are a rich food. Um, my wife studied, uh, did, uh, brought people to Uttarakhand one, one summer for her study abroad. And she told me about the chutney that they make with hemp seeds in that part of India. Uh, that have been made for a very long time. So I bet you the people eating that chutney have a stronger endocannabinoid system. Uh, so that's uh, that's what I would try. Uh, I have a two-part question, but one kind of follows from the other. Uh, is cannabis intake creating the illusion of spirituality or actually giving access to it? Because how would science evaluate that, given it's not measurable? That could be problematic as well. The other part related to that is. Um, People have been using these substances within a certain context, traditionally in different regions. Um, the traditional practices that go with it, I'm sure they come together in creating a certain effect by using this product. Um, how is it going to work in the way you are suggesting if you take it out of that context, but also the plant also is a whole whole substance if you take out one aspect of it like you take curcumin out of turmeric i don't know how effective it is as opposed to having turmeric so that was i don't know if i confused the question but oh. that, that was my question well, uh, uh, very very thank you aditi so let me say the first thing about illusions so and science you know th we are talking about deeply subjective phenomena uh, the feature of this is that it is very hard to describe it. Um, and, and in our, because we're talking about a different state of consciousness, a non, this was, right now what we're mostly in is the ordinary consciousness state, um, you know, rational, linear, that kind of thing. And in, when you're in this uh, cannabis and other entheogen induced states, it's a non-ordinary state. There's all kinds of different features. People have called it mosaic thinking as opposed to linear thinking, for example. Um, and I think, you know, what's really an area of science that's been lost uh, is actually self-experiment. Uh, the uh, uh, Robert Hooke, Sir Robert Hooke, he was the inventor of the microscope, the first uh, compound microscope, and um, described uh, the word cell that we actually, he wrote, he was the one who coined the word cell. Um, he was the, you know, predecessor to Isaac Newton. 
if you read, uh, uh, he gave a talk in the Royal Society in the 1600s on his own self experiments with cannabis. Uh, somebody had been captured in Sri Lanka and brought back cannabis with them to Europe, and he took it. Uh, he tried to grow it, uh, and he I think he didn't have the uh, THC-rich cannabis. He had some other kind of fibrous material, but he still had some experiences and effects. I think that's really pretty cool. Uh, I mean, that a scientist is willing to say, well, is there something to this or not? Is this, is this real? Let me try it. You know, and I think that um, uh, that's where I think science should begin on this inquiry um, is, is because we're, we're, you, you need to use your own senses, your own mind as an observer, as an experiencer. Uh, and there's a, there's a term for this that uh, psychologist William James coined called radical empiricism. So you radically get into the experience of it by experiencing it yourself. So, um, you know, and then there's other object, then later on, if you're looking at the benefits of uh, looking at like, what are the indicia of spiritual experiences? There's different questionnaires and surveys. Uh, the National Institutes of Health, NIH, has developed a um, healing experiences of all life stressors, 37 item questionnaire that we actually use in my practice that includes psychosocial spiritual questions. Um, you know, and, you know, these things do change from culture and context. Um, um, but, uh, you know, even in, in India, some of the uh, Indian Institutes of Social Science have developed uh, spiritual health rating skills. Uh, and I think that's, those, that's the way that scientists have come together. Like, here's how we can kind of look at this. What are all the features, you know? And then you can also look at health benefits, um, you know, like uh, biomarkers even. Maybe there's changes in your length of your DNA. Maybe your cortisol levels uh, in your saliva uh, come down. Uh, so there are different, um, you know, markers that you might look at um, to, to, to investigate that. So that's what I, I would say about that, illusions and, and reality. Um, and, um, and, you know, and I think one last thing is to say about that is, you know, there's that very famous, I think, in the issue of Punisher, lead me from the unreal to the real is sort of this, this uh, there's a lot of focus on what is real, what is illusion. You know, that's one of the big questions. And what's how is a is a non ordinary state of consciousness that you can 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 experience by taking in a plant is that real? And if it, or is this unreal and that's real? Like who knows what's what? And can and the reason why because Carl Sagan was saying I opened about this talks he gleaned greater understandings about the world when he was in that state of mind. So there's something really real there, I think. Okay, the other qu uh, question about context. Human beings uh, have created, we have mixed and remixed uh, and triply mixed uh, our cultures and contexts for eons. That is sort of the nature of, we are meaning-making, cultural-creating machines. I mean, beings. And uh, I think um, uh, people create context all the time, and the cultures continuously evolve and change. Um, my contention is that just like, uh, you know, uh, people come together and they, they say, oh, here's a body of water that we, that we care about. Let's protect this body of water. Let's use it for our drinking water. Let's, um, let's make sure it stays, it stays well and clean and healthy. This is, this is not a natural part of, um, you know, uh, there's nothing written anywhere that we have to create this context around water, but we do it because there is a survival value and a health value that human beings have discovered if you take care of things this way. My contention is that cannabis and other entheogens are basically forces of nature. They're parts of the natural world that we human beings have been coming into contact with since time immemorial, um, and that we, we, need, we are naturally prone to finding contexts and ways to uh, incorporate them. Uh, and I think that these, some of these old texts are, are uh, insights that will help guide us. But what we create today will be nothing like what was done thousands of years ago. Uh, we will create what is con uh, necessary for the 2022. Um, but uh, I think that, um, that, that we can be informed by this and if only, if you don't have criminalized laws and you don't have constant stigma of people being told that these substances, this is what I was told from age five or four years old until age 20, so cannabis and these things are dangerous drugs, that they will destroy your mind, they will turn you into addicts, 
you should stay away from them. People who are associated with them are criminal, are no good. I mean, it was extremely stigmatized like this. So it's very um, not surprising to me that we didn't don't create systems of, of respect. But I think if we start to educate ourselves, uh, it will naturally form. That's my, that's my contention and belief. Uh, and last thing to say about that is that alcohol is, the old, is older than the earth itself. Uh, you know, many people thought, oh, we can prohibit alcohol. You know, there was all these uh, prohibition movements. But you can find clouds of alcohol gas with radio telescopes. So life has had to come in contact with alcohol before humans for a long time, and we developed enzymes and genes to break it down for that reason. So in the same way, I think we have a co-evolved relationship with entheogens. Actually, mine are not questions. They are just comments because, mm -hmm. you know, you experience and then you remember, oh, this is what happened because I know I'm currently, I've been in excruciating pain because I'm having, I have shingles. So when nothing mm -hmm. was working, my son said, why don't I get you some ganja? Because mm -hmm. I live in California. Mm -hmm. so why don't you have some meat? I said, you know what? We'll see about it. <laughs> I mean, I know it. I don't criminalize it. I don't, uh, like, uh, have any this thing against it? I actually enjoy my uh, hang on holy and shivratri. <laughs> but you know, this is how we grew up, and we have Hindus have usually used it. Most most of the public has used it very cautiously. Of course, there are people I know I have known justices and gandharis and all, but then there are all sorts of people everywhere. We have alcoholics too. So I was just. Sharing my little funny things that came to my mind. <laughs> it was wonderful. That's a beautiful share. I did, I think. Thank you, uh, Poonamji, for for your share. And I, I think it's um, I, one of the things I didn't get a chance to talk much about is the um, the way of using these aspects of the spiritual or deeper healing in the healing of things like bodily pain, severe bodily pain, or um, other kinds of uh, inflictions and maladies that that uh, we know cannabis has uh, ability to help. And one of the things that uh, cannabis really is good at is helping helping with nerve pain. Uh, it's one of the things that is very hard. There's very it's very hard to treat nerve pain because the nervous system itself is activated, uh, and it can be burning, pain, you know, shooting, all kinds of terrible things. Um, but this, uh, when you stimulate the endocannabinoid system, it seems like you increase what are called the descending pain pathways, which help us just kind of put a distance between ourselves and the, 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 the pain. Uh, and then actually, once you distance yourself a little bit, you can actually relate to it a little bit better. Oh, okay. So that now, because, you know, when you're in chronic pain, sometimes you just like, I just want to turn off that part of my body. I don't care about that arm anymore. I don't care about that leg. I don't care about that. that I just, just want it. I want it gone. And that is a uh, that's a kind of a disintegrated state. But in order to heal, we have to come. We have to you know have our whole contact, our whole awareness about the body. And so cannabis has a tool. Uh, this type of medicine, I think, helps in that way. Is, is that was that your experience, uh, you know, with with it? Actually, uh, that's what I, I was thinking because the doctor has given me, uh, you know, we used to prescribe because I'm a nurse. I'm in the medical field. We used to prescribe a lot of oxycodone, which has, you know, what it is. I don't have to explain. So till we develop the hydrocodone, which they say does not stimulate the pleasure center, you know what I mean? I don't know. I take, I'm take i taking it for the first time. I didn't take it for my fractures, but now for my nerve pain, I'm taking it and I'm taking a lot of it. And, and what, what did you, what, what have you found? Like, what, what does it feel like? like I, I, actually, I have not found anything because... I'm not bigger. I have taken alcohol. I've taken the stuff. I mean, not the drugs, but alcohol occasionally. But I've never really like enjoyed the feeling because I lose control and I'm a mm. control freak. So, but with this hydrocodone, I feel I just fall asleep. And it gives me right. a peaceful sleep for at least five hours. Otherwise, with pain, I'll be taking 40 more drinks a day and not going anywhere. Are you taking cannabis for, for, for your pain right now? Is that, or no, not I'm yet? taking hydrocodone. <laughs> That's okay, what my son right. is saying. Okay. Well, your son, your son is on the right. Oil, I, yeah, you're, 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 yeah. I don't believe, I'm not a purist. I don't believe like, you know, some drug. I don't want to say good drugs, bad drugs. I think everything has a role. I, I'm in integrative medicine. So I want to bring the best of all things together. There's, there's research that shows if you mix opioids with cannabis, you can actually improve the 
pain relieving effect and again, take lower dose of opioids. That's called pharmaceutical sparing. Can you reduce the dose of something with bringing in something else? And I think that's what you, you might be able to discover. Um, and uh, you know, I may have less constipation, you know, so because that's a side effect of the of opioids is constipation. And uh, uh, doctor, do you do you see more widespread use of cannabis uh, uh, more legitimately? Uh, and uh, would this be more used for tapping the creative uh, awareness among people, like what yeah. was used? Uh, during ancient, even uh, even Pythagoras has has used this. Plato has used it. And when we talk about Upanishads, we had some of the finest souls on universe using this. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> is is there is there a rising awareness towards more an empathetic world as we see more widespread use of cannabis? Oh my gosh! Uh, so uh, I uh, let let us hope. You know, I think we can pray and hope for that. I mean, listen, I could never imagine talking uh, about this topic on on a, on a medium like this Sangam Talks. You know, uh, it's really, it, which means like coming together. You know, Sangam is coming together. Uh, also, like a, I looked it up, it also means a confluence of rivers. So I, I think that if we can bring that river, that stream into our uh, uh, community awareness, I, I think it's only natural. Yeah. I, Artists and creativity is like a, you know, because it's actually, uh, there's a, actually a philosophical term. It's called the dialectic of reconcilable estrangement, which means you actually see, you, you have a experience with cannabis or other things where you say, oh, everything is new. It's strange to me. Like I, I, you might be looking at your, you know, my lamp or my bookshelf. I, I look at it every day. I've stopped paying attention to that, that part of my room or, you know, this, this, uh, some idea. But then cannabis sort of makes everything feel new, you know, and so it's like, oh, yeah, that's right. That's a new thing. And then you kind of uh, have a dialectic with that and you come back. Oh, yeah, this is new, but I also it's familiar, too. So something is new is, is uh, familiar. Then it becomes new. And then you mix the newness with the familiar and you get a new understanding. That's called the dialectic of reconcilable estrangement. You need that when you're doing creative work. You have to come, you know, uh, how do you get out of a block? Let me look at something in a different way. Let me go away from it for a little while. Let me come back to it. You know, that's what we do. So I, I think that um, creativity, uh, untapped creativity is, uh, these are these are why artists all around, hip hop, jazz musicians, Salvador Dali, surrealists, like this is, a kind of, it's, this is already, this is known. Ask any of your artist friends, you know, who went to some art school and maybe there was some kind of, they, 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 all, they all speak about this. So I, I do think that that, and you know, everybody, uh, all children are artists. Everybody has natural creativity. So you don't just have to be, you know, a trained artist. And so I think that that would definitely be something. Um, and then as I am seeing, you know, I am living in, in the West Coast of the United States and, you know, cannabis has become, you know, they passed a law in my state recently here um, that uh, we have removed the word marijuana from the, all the state laws. They've just said, and we don't use that word anymore. We're using cannabis because marijuana in the U.S. was associated with a anti-Mexican slang, you know, uh, in the 20, in the teens, uh, after it, when there was a lot of immigration going on. So that's kind of a nice thing. Language matters. You know, how you say, name something. Uh, and then the other example I want to give on that, Rajiv G is Oklahoma. This is, this is my home state. My parents are from Northern India and they immigrated to Oklahoma, which had the most draconian laws of marijuana in the United States, maybe even in the Western Hemisphere, you could go to jail for your whole life if they found you growing a plant. This is, some of these cases are there. Uh, now, I went back home recently, and uh, medicinal use of cannabis is so widespread there. I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of people have cannabis authorizations from their doctors. If you, you see billboards in my old hometown, uh, which is very famous, a uh, place called Muskogee, the first line of the song, which is heard around the world. We don't smoke marijuana in Muskogee. That's the that's my hometown. But you go to the first thing you see when you drive into Muskogee is the billboards. You know, here, here, stop here and get some good quality cannabis. You know, there's a lot of people suffering in Oklahoma. You know, a lot of sadness, I guess, and a lot of pain. And 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 there is unfortunately there's a lot of overdose deaths. We have one of the highest teen pregnancy rates in the entire country. I mean, there's a lot of problems in, in, uh, in Oklahoma. So if places like Oklahoma can turn like that, 
in my lifetime, you know, I have to say that there's a lot of changes happening. And I think that's a, that's a very good thing. And, uh, and absolutely in India too, so many things are happening. Um, uh, so that's very exciting. I have a question, like in the 60s and 70s, we had a lot of these people. Um, Beatles came to Maharishi Mahesh Yogi and, uh, you know, everybody. So, uh, because in India, the spiritual and social acceptance of cannabis has been forever. Like you said, it's very old. I'll say it's as old as Shivji, you know, <laughs> uh, because I'm older. <laughs> older. <laughs> right. Yeah, because if she, Shivji was already consuming it, that means it existed when he was there. Uh, so, uh, so the acceptance has always been there. Then when did this happen? When is it that we are trying to emulate British laws or the whites and all? How come it became a bad word in India? Yeah, that's a, you know, what the original phase, uh, the first phase was in the late 19th century when um, Br British were taxing and making as much money as they could out of India. Um, they, uh, then there was this sort of like, okay, we're, we're taxing it, we're selling it, we're making a lot, lot of, lot of uh, money out of it. And then there was a big commission in the 1893 called the Indian Hemp Drugs Commission. It's like 10 volumes. And they did all kinds of interviews with all kinds of government officials. And they said, oh, cannabis is sort of just part of the culture here. It's normal. It's, it seem, uh, there's not like a bunch of people filling up the lunatic asylums. There was all this kind of concern. And honestly, uh, one author thinks that the reason it all started is because some of the farmers that were growing cannabis decided to, to set their fields on fire or their shipments because they did not want to pay the excise tax. There was lots of taxes being pulled out. And so the association of cannabis with renegade behavior began because of an evasion of a colonial tax scheme. That's one theory of the beginning of like, oh, this is not as, this is associated with people who don't follow rules. You know, that's kind of the first association. And then, and then, you know, um, as I mentioned in my talk, like the 1960s treaty, uh, the UN treaty single convention gave 25 years to India to uh, gradually eliminate cannabis, which took effect in the mid eighties. Uh, and that, that is sort of, uh, and there was also, uh, when Nixon was in president, um, Nepal, uh, also had a pretty extensive, you know, which is a lot, lot of Shiva uh, worship culture in Nepal, a lot of temples there and things like that. Uh, and there was many, you can look at the posters from that those days, Eden Hash uh, Shop is very beautiful posters. And so people came from all over there and um, Nixon said, you know, we're going to cut aid to Nepal. You know, if you keep allowing this to go on, because these people, and I have a whole article on Richard Nixon, it was a political tool of suppression uh, against anti-war protesters. That why he was so he was so rabidly against cannabis. He was a he was homophobic. He was racist. And for him, this was he says the good people of the world drink, and the uh, the bad people of the world use marijuana. That's what he said. You, you, I actually I have there's recordings of the uh, video uh, audio tapes in the White House where he's describing his philosophy. So it was really just cultural bigotry. And so he was against these people who were against the war. He were his political enemies. He told Nepal, you better like stop it. And so that's how things started. It's really ridiculous. And then, you know, Timothy Leary, Allen Ginsberg, they, um, you know, uh, and of course, Ram Dass, uh, you know, these are some of the folks that, that came from Harvard and, 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 and discovered some of these, uh, these insights. Timothy Leary actually went to his, he was arrested for cannabis. He was a psychologist and uh, he went to the, his case went to the Supreme Court and he argued that his use of cannabis was in fact spiritual and religious that he had visited Kolkata. He'd been to the, you know, funeral areas. And, and for him, it was like, he was adopt, he adopted those views and the court didn't buy it. So, you know, you're from some, you know, some place in America, you're, you're not, that's not your true religion. So we're not going to count that. So, you know, but Timothy that, Leary who, was uh, fired from Harvard because he was experimenting with his students with LSD. Um, that's, right, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. that's right. With their consent. These were adults. Uh, I mean, you know, they, they were they were adults and he was experimenting on prisoners. He was, he was it was a, it was an interesting time, but it wasn't like they were doing anything against anybody's consent. Um, and but yeah, he did. He had to go. Uh, and so did Allen Ginsberg. And but uh, sorry, no, um, uh, what's his name? Richard Alpert. Um, Ellen yeah. Ginsberg is, is a poet who's also um, yeah, yeah, uh, written yeah, a lot yeah. about his experience with cannabis. I am. I'm, so, I'm a big follower of Ramdas and Krishnadas and this tradition entirely. Oh, yeah, they're beautiful. I mean, and Ramdas very famously, his guru said, you know, 
oh, I, I tried LSD and I didn't do anything for me because I was already in a bliss state, you know? And so a, a lot of these people are like, well, you still need to have the insight moment, but then what do you do with that beyond that? How do you make this what we call integrated into your life? You know, not, not just, oh, only, only when I have this experience, take this drug that I'm in a, a more bliss state, but no, you need bliss 24 seven, you know, as much as you can. So that's where the tools of meditation and, and prayer and community and all the kind of things that, that, uh, that uh, can help you integrate. And I think that's the uh, earlier to answer the earlier question or how do, how will we actually not just turn this into a big commodity or a big, a big, um, you know, fad and, and, and take it out of context. Well, it's really not the story is not about the drug. The drug is important, but the integration of the experiences of the drug of the substance, that's really that's where we're going to achieve more than we hopefully have, have ever done, um, you know, since the earlier waves. And uh, yeah, there's so much. In India has a lot to be proud of when it comes to the, all the exposures that it it gave a refuge to a lot of people in the 60s in the in my country in the U.S. who were dealing with all this war, and also all these Israeli soldiers that fight this horrible occupation in Palestine. They all come to India every year, you know, uh, to uh, the Manali Malani Valley. A Parvati Valley, and um, you know, and the, I've met them in these shops, and they say this is how, this helps me forget all the ta the terror I went through. So anyway, it's a very useful thing, and uh, and uh, India did seed the world with this. <laughs> I mean, long time ago. Uh, yeah. So these days we have a lot of Israelis, also Israeli kids, rather. Uh, they do their one year in army, and then they get a lot of money, mm. and they come here and uh, settle in. Dharamshala and Parvati Valley and Manari and uh, one of them happened to say that there are 8 million of us out of that 6 million are roaming around in India. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, interestingly, uh, cannabis is increasingly blamed for high levels of uh, schizophrenia. For some reason, uh, I and I have not come across any papers or research specifically done in Fiji and why it is the case and you have even uh, former cannabis users coming uh, up uh, on you know news media etc TV as um, as advocates of against uh, cannabis use uh, because uh, you know for example I'm quoting someone who said that uh, you take cannabis it'll just give you like a well I guess he was meaning one time high like high state and then after that, it, you'll never get it again. Actually, I have a, I have a chronic insomnia and I've actually taken a packet of diazepam. I'm still not able to sleep. So uh, probably if cannabis is legalized in Fiji, probably do you think it would help me with my uh, sleep issues? Uh, I do think it might help that, yes. It's uh, not, uh, I know many of my patients over the years I've been practicing with cannabis uh, that's one of the standard uses is insomnia. It helps people fall asleep. Uh, and, and that's sort of the higher THC probably element. There's also a chemical called CBN, which is, can, can help with sedating. And then there's a chemical called myrcene, which is like in found in mangoes actually. Uh, but it's also found in cannabis and it, it, it may also have sedative properties. So there's so many different varieties of cannabis. You want to find the ones that have the, 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 the properties that you want more, like if you want sedation and sleep, you want to find high myrcene, CBN, um, THC. So uh, I think um, a schizophrenia comment, thank you, uh, Vishwath, for asking about that. And it's nice to talk to somebody all the way in Fiji. Um, there, there's this issue, this is why I mentioned the 1890 Hemp Drugs Commission report, because back in the, there was somebody who stood up in the British Parliament and said, the lunatic asylums in India are full of ganja smokers. That's what they, that's what they, there was a, there was a, a myth or a, a, a fear. But it, uh, when they did research and they looked in all the insane asylums and all the different cities in India, like there was really like no cases, or maybe there was one case they say was, you know, people were using cannabis. They couldn't make any causal association. There were people who had problems who also turned to cannabis, but it wasn't clear if they were using those, that they had the problem and they were using cannabis to help them deal with the psychotic or other social, uh, other uh, mental health issues. The clinical, the epidemiological research has not shown any kind of causal association between cannabis use and the chronic schizophrenia. Although there are people that it potent, there's a question of will it, might it unmask if you're prone to psychosis by age 30, 
But if you started using cannabis at age 20, um, would you have developed your psychosis later in your life? Had you not used can did cannabis accelerate an already uh, an hour uh, a process? That that's a question that people have. I think all of these things are um, the global incidence of schizophrenia remains at one percent, even though all over the world cannabis use has gone up, like in the Western countries, like quite a bit. Um, there's not been any large changes in that level, so I don't think that's happening. I think I think what's happening is the reduction of CBD. Uh, and the increasing amount of THC in cannabis actually pro produces more likelihood of developing kind of an anxiety response, as I was describing earlier. So uh, what, you, what you need to do is have more CBD cannabis. CBD is called cannabidiol, and it is an antipsychotic. It's actually an antipsychotic. There's, there's studies in Germany and the UK where they have given people CBD capsule um, versus a standard antipsychotic, and they do better, or they do not just as well, the schizophrenic patients. Um, so uh, CBD uh, needs to be around in cannabis to help to reduce some of the likelihood of some of those adverse effects. And the level of THC should also be reduced, or, or there, there's people, people need to have access to different strengths. And, and so if you, if you do that, you're less likely to develop these kinds of, of uh, adverse reactions. But the chronic, like the, I became psychotic and I never got better again and I was always in that state, that is sort of a, that's a reefer madness. There's actually a term, reefer madness, because in the 1930s, there was a movie that they circulated called Reefer Madness, where they showed young people jumping out of windows when they took cannabis and all kinds of crazy things. They've actually made a musical out of it now. It's kind of a joke now. But uh, this is kind of a chronic, uh, you know, like uh, concern. And I think it has to do with, you know, cannabis, like, as, as, um, as Carl Sagan was saying, can make you feel like you understand what it's like to be crazy. He was saying that in my first thing. I don't know if you heard that when I was initially reading. I read his uh, his comments on cannabis. He's a famous astronomer. And he said that it helps him understand what it is to be crazy. And that's that can be hard for us to appreciate. One more thing to say. In some parts of India and Asia, there is a, a, uh, a fear that using cannabis will cause your penis to fall off. Um, um, or that you'll be, be able to never uh, or shrink it up. Uh, I think that's called Koro. Uh, is, there's, a, there's a kind of a, some kind, it's also like a cultural, uh, like kind of paranoia. And so that the, every place has something like this. And honestly, I think this is kind of our deep-seated fears. Uh, I, I think as a people, nobody really was, is, 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 are afraid of, of changing their consciousness. And I think these kind of myths start as kind of those things. But with education and, and more CBD, people will, will not develop psychotic, chronic psychotic issues. Um, and so I think that's that's what I would say. And I, I think a lot of people go on media because they get paid to do that. Um, very famously, um, there's a, a famous uh, Sonny and Cher. They were like kind of hippie icons. I Got You Babe is a song from the 60s. And then he made he became a politician, Sonny did, and he made videos saying, hey, we should we shouldn't you shouldn't use cannabis even though he used it so much in, in his life too um and i think again everything matters context matters any drug if i gave it to you over and over in a context where you're not feeling safe and understood it will help it will make you not feel good you know that's just uh, how it is but if you are given a more uh, welcoming context uh, i think it should be fine and uh, i hope it'll uh i know i don't know where fiji is with cannabis but i have been talking to uh somebody in mauritius um, uh, Ritesh Dawu is his name, and he's been he's been really working with the different committees there, and I've been talking to a doctor there as well. Uh, so, in case you want to put it, be put in touch with any of those folks, if that would help you in Fiji, I'd be happy to to connect you. I think um, it 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 should it should be uh, hopefully uh, happening if if uh, doctors and and health people get educated. Um, Hawaii, uh, you know, uh, has a uh, more liberal use of cannabis and, you know, Fiji and Hawaii are very close to each other. So hopefully that, uh, that, that can help as well. And uh, even if you go to, go to the, we have only one uh, psychiatric sort of hospital in the whole of the country of, uh, of, of just over a million. And uh, one of the, uh, one of the first questions that, uh, you know, after you have uh, 
answer your gender name, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, your home address. You know, have you used marijuana or cannabis, etc. Currently, the government and the police um, are quite uh, anti-cannabis, uh, but they have, uh, I think, followed uh, the lead of New Zealand uh, in uh, sort of uh, decriminalizing hemp. Um, so it can be grown. We currently get imported him, you know, him powder, etc., as protein supplements. But uh, cannabis, cannabis, I think it will be a hard sell because of of the notion that it it it, uh, it increases uh, schizophrenia. Mm. Okay. Uh, thank you for asking, Vishal. I, I it made me think of one thing. First of all, I, I forgot to mention in my earlier response. There is a gene called COMT, stands for catechethyl, catechol O methyl transferase. It makes dopamine. It's part of the dopamine metabolism in the brain. And there are some people that have a different uh, gene mutation in that, well, poly polymorphism. Uh, and it seems like in some of the studies, they those people tend to be uh, a little bit more prone to some of the psychotic effects, short-term psychotic effects of cannabis. There are also people that... Uh, uh, tend to have red hair. They tend to have uh, different type of pain thresholds than other people. Like if you give the same pain stimulus, so there are there are con- chemical genetic factors that make some people more prone to adverse effects with different substances. And that's just that's just one of the things that I think you know I should I wanted to mention. It's not like everybody's going to be the same. And there are some people who really shouldn't be using anything like this because they're too sensitive or they have strong history of problems. So I I, I want to be clear about that. Like it's not like this is true for everybody. The other thing I wanted to tell you is that um, even in like uh, the uh, lower classes in the U.S. that have, have fought for their freedom, like the African-American, the black uh, freedom movements, uh, the, uh, I had a friend who was part of that, who we grew up in that. And he says that a lot of their um, teachings were like to stay away from all these kinds of drugs and substances and that they would be ways to keep you away from the revolutionary work that you're supposed to be doing. That these are like these are uh, opium of the masses you know, to keep you kind of preoccupied and not really focused on, you know, your education, your uh, economic mobility, your freedom. And, um, and so I think that um, uh, that is a kind of a, a universal sense that maybe even among the Fijian lower class people who have struggled for a long time for their uh, autonomy and freedom, they don't want to get sidetracked. I think, um, I think it's, uh, what what I'm saying is that maybe there is a sense in which cannabis can help people, um, you know, deal with the stigma of being a lower class, underclass person, you know, because it actually, it can help you kind of re- relax because being lower in the lower classes, you're always stressed. Everybody's always shitting on, excuse me, like giving you negative words and you're feeling like bad all the time. You know, there's a lot of stigmas that get internalized. It's called internalized oppression. So cannabis can maybe help with relieve some of that and maybe people may help people feel a little bit more like dignified and, and that might help them make better community uh, for resistance against the, uh, you know, in the political goals they have. Um, and that's, I think, you know, your ancestors, uh, the Fijians that came, like they came in the 19th century and the ones that came to Jamaica, they, and there's been research that's been done on those, the, the descendants of those populations in the last uh, 50 years, 30 years as uh, anthropologists have gone they say they use ganja to help them work harder. They, it, it helps them deal with the monotony of like of the work, you know, and that it kind of gives them a little bit more focus. And um, and so I think that um, that that's sort of why people brought cannabis with them. it. It sort of uh, helps to raise people's misery a little bit, reduce the misery. So I I, I think that uh, education would be good. The psych t- the psych world. Absolutely, people want to ask you if you use cannabis because um, because sometimes people do get into trouble with substances, and, and cannabis is the most widely used one. Uh, and uh, it's important to know if somebody is is having problems. And but it, it, just asking the question shouldn't be you know it's important that that people can ask questions and get trust for the answers, and the doctors aren't going to judge them. You know, I I think. I think um, uh, it sounds like in Fiji right now, doctors all think it's bad and, and the psych hospitals thinks it's dangerous. But I can tell you there's many, um, you know, psychi- I've been to the American Psychiatry Association, one of the world's largest group of psychiatrists. And I, I gave a talk in Hawaii there in 2011. 
and it was one. It, no, there was no room to sit in the in the lecture hall. People had to stand or sit on the aisles because it was the room was full. Um, that's how much interest there was. And uh, I told all the psychiatrists that actually I gave uh, some of the uh, in the sixties, uh, in the seventies, when uh, Nixon was saying all the negative things about cannabis and and you know fighting the war. He also he also didn't like psychiatrists as a field at all. He thought that psychiatrists were the ones that were pushing cannabis into these drugs, and that they all. And he also he says that they were all they were all Jewish. What the hell is wrong with these Jewish psychiatrists? This is what he said. Was, these are very racist, like as I was saying. So there was actually a stigma that psychiatrists were associated with these kind of drugs and substances that they are also fighting against. You know, they don't want to be seen as these like, oh, you know, anything goes. So they, they in response will become more rigid. Oh no, we're all we're just we're focusing. We don't believe that stuff anymore. But but that's how it started in the '60s and '70s was a stigma against psychiatrists that they were too interested in cannabis. Um, and uh, the the directors of anyway, I can go on about that. But I just wanted you to. I think the context matters. I don't think this is like inherent with psychiatry. I think you can make a psychiatry in which cannabis is, uh, and we did that in, in my clinic. You know, uh, and of course CBD, like I was saying non-psychoactivating, less THC, these things can have a huge benefit for conditions like um, anxiety, depressed mood, insomnia, seizure disorder. I mean, so many things. So uh, that's what I think uh, people need to just study that evidence. And uh, I'll be happy to come. Uh, you can email me at humansunil at gmail.com. Maybe we can, uh, uh, I can give a talk someplace or educate. Uh, I, I think, um, I think, uh, and by the way, the fact that hemp is legal there and you can import things, can you also cultivate the hemp there or you just have to import it only? The hemp uh, one is quite recent. I think they're uh, working out for the cultivation. They're working uh, at the legis legislation and the regulations of it. So I'm, uh, I'm not sure exactly what will they do. Would they use the... Uh, uh, to make like protein powder, etc., and also for as uh, you know, a, co um, a fabric Rope. for clothing, etc. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that's excellent. This is a collection of images that I've uh, put together of kind of the different around the world. Um, these substances, not just cannabis, but uh, uh, many sub substances utilized in in different religions. Uh, so um, here on the uh, top left are some of the churches in the United States that use ayahuasca. Um, uh, and this is a pouring of ayahuasca tea in South America. This is a uh, from the um, Mexico, a woman uh, with mushrooms in, in, a, in a ritual. Uh, this is a, a, a Christian uh, drinking wine and wafer as part of the communion. Um, this is a bhang lassi. Uh, this is iboga in West Africa. Um, these two, uh, you know, a Kali worshiper. This is a Sufi peer at a shrine in Pakistan, both smoking cannabis from Chilam. Uh, this is a ancient Israelite temple uh, in a place called Tel Arad, where they discovered the residue of cannabis on the temple, a holy altar. Uh, re this is a recent discovery, and it showed that cannabis was part of the rituals of the ancient Israelites, like long, long time ago. This is the uh, uh, president of Bolivia, uh, Evo Morales, holding the coca leaves. Uh, as describing it. this is a kava ceremony in uh, South Pacific. I thought, since you were mentioning kava, it made me think of this. You know, and this this is also a sacred ritual of. Um, people, um, you know, coming together and sharing information and things like that. Um, these are actually uh, in the American South. People uh, handle snakes and they drink venom from the snake, uh, strychnine. And they, they, they let them, you know, as part of their, uh, they want to like experience that poison and then get close to dying. And then they, they survive and become stronger. People have actually died in these rituals, but uh, it, it goes on. These are, uh, all of these are examples of legitimate religious practices 
where people are bringing in these substances. And then this is a salvia divinorum leaves. And over here is a peyote ceremony in a, like in, in American uh, context, Na Native American. So I just wanted you to know, like, I think the, every place has things like this. Um, and I think the introduction of intuitive activities like that is really, uh, can be a healthy way for people to process people who, you know, basically these Ouija, these kind of things are, are, are scenarios where people can kind of practice their intuitive sense. Like, oh, you know, when you pull a tarot card, what comes up next? How do you deal with the randomness of the world? Am I going to, is the Ouija going to go left or it's going to go right? What's, where is the friction greater today? What's the wind currents? You know, there's so much chaos that, that, that determines where it goes. And so it's a way for us to help make meaning out of a very, very complex world. And people who are in psychotic states, like, I mean, maybe they have greater, in, a, a lot of traditional cultures consider these people as, uh, as uh, great wisdom holders, that they had a greater understanding of the world and they kind of saw things in a different light. Um, so that is, there, there's a movie called Crazy Wise, a documentary which talks about uh, different conceptions of, of psychosis around the world and mental illness. So it's not always necessarily seen as this bad, dangerous thing that we have to lock people up and give them medicines. Obviously, if they're a risk of harm to themselves and others. But oftentimes it's just not, people are not understood. And um, anyway, and the last thing I wanted to tell you is that there's a, uh, a friend of mine in Canada has started a marijuana paranoia management coaching. So people who develop these kind of sensitivities to cannabis, sometimes it's because there's some issue that's coming up and they don't want to deal with it or they're afraid of it. And, and if you actually sit through some coaching, uh, he has a book you can actually uh, get online, which helps you kind of sit with some of those uncomfortable thoughts. And sometimes people, it's actually things that are coming up that you don't want to deal with. And that you, if you engage with therapist, you can actually uh, get better and relieve some of that. So I, all, not all uncomfortable experiences are bad. Sometimes uncomfortable experiences are good and necessary in order to get to the next stage of, of your healing. So I think that's another thing too. We're like, we're so used to, I want something that makes me feel good. Oh, this made me feel bad. I don't like that. Uh, I'm done with that. So that's what I wanted to tell you, uh, Vishad, Vish, Visharad, that it has this, I think, um, uh, chance to, to help us get deeper into our minds. And uh, uh, the, uh, I believe that Indians in Fiji can have a good opportunity to uh, better understand the needs of indigenous peoples and other minority groups. Uh, that's something that um, uh, a writer here in the U.S., Vijay Prashad, has written, um, that uh, the karma of brown folks is what he calls it. Um, just there's an old book called The Souls of Black Folks by W.B. Du Bois, who talks about how there needs to be a global consciousness of black people around the world who've been always at the foot of colonial rule uh, and oppression, enslavement, and Indians were kind of in the middle, you know, uh, uh, in that. And, and so the good thing for Indians is to help um, help to connect with the uh, people who are even more uh, discriminated and that we, we can, it's our karma to help um, support. So I, I want to see, I, I think all these divide and conquer strategies, this group against that group, that's actually colonial strategy of control. In Trinidad, um, there was a lot more mixing of the groups. Uh, uh, sorry, in, in Trinidad, there was a separation of the groups, whereas in South America, there was more mixing, like of the uh, Indians and the Africans and uh, the natives. Uh, but in other, in other parts of the Caribbean where the, uh, your ancestors also came, when they, they wanted to separate people, because they knew if they come together, they're they gonna push against the, um, the sugar plantain uh, masters. That's, this is true, I'm not making any of this up. I mean, this is literally, there's like articles about this. Um, so I think that's, that's another, again, feature that I think cannabis and such drugs could offer a kind of a peace offering between different groups um, and, and stop the divide and conquer, which I, by the way, I think is also true in India. Uh, you know, the division of India and Pakistan was a colonial strategy to divide and conquer, you know, between groups that had been there for, for eons and lived together. Uh, my grandmother is from, is from Lahore, you know, before partition and people lived uh, together in this, in this city, you know, Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs. And, uh, and then it was only political division that drove it to such mass slaughter. So I, I'm, I'm, I really, I really believe that um, I, I like the Rastafarian notion that cannabis can be the healing of the nations. 
maybe there's something that can help us to is is that is that a uh, ridiculous notion? I don't think so. I mean, we need peace. People are dying. All the, there's so much violence and hatred. So we need to find the things that are going to. And look, cannabis has connected me to you all. I I would have never met you. I, I never met anybody. But I hardly meet anybody from Fiji or other places. Like, how cool is that? You know, and other other people who are listening. So this is the kind of the beauty of these plants is that they can help us connect.